Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Holm. I'm with Bernard's. Uh, as the 2020 uh, chair of the AI Los Angeles Healthcare Committee, I'd like to welcome you to our June event featuring the Providence Cedar sinai Tarzana Medical Center Reimagined Project. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, our committee's mission is to educate and inspire the healthcare design and planning communities with panel discussions, uh, project presentations, tours of local healthcare facilities, um, and also with student emerging professional focus presentations. And usually we have them on the third uh, Wednesday of every month. Um, during this, this strange time, while we miss the in-person networking um, opportunities in the city line and cheese, and uh, prior to our, present, our presentations, we have been um, delighted to welcome out of town a uh, guest uh, to, to join us. Last month, we actually had uh, somebody join us all the way from Montreal. So it's also three time zones ahead. So um, at this juncture, I, I just wanted to see if there was anyone from out of town. And, and if you want to just shout out, unmute and shout out and where you're, you're, you're joining us from. Um, if anyone is, we, we, we welcome you. Thank you so much for uh, joining us from out of town. If, you're, if you are indeed, I heard somebody from Oregon earlier. Um. Pittsburgh. Oh, wow. Three time zones ahead. Welcome. All right. Um, anyone else? Okay. Um, great. All right. Well, welcome to all of you. Uh, now I'd like to introduce to you my uh, co-chair. You all know her, Han V. Chen, and she'll announce our July event. Hi, everybody. Great to see so many faces. Um, thank you for attending. Uh, so I'm Han V. Chen. I'm with HOK, and uh, Eric and I are co-chairing the committee this year. Um, so for the July event, the event is tentatively scheduled for July 15th. And what we wanted to do was with all the current events going on, we thought that it would be great to team up with SoCal NOMA and do a um, moderated panel discussion about racial, racial injustice and sort of everything that's kind of happening in our current events and really try to focus on how it affects um, the healthcare design and construction industry. So we're currently trying to get our panel together and I think um, who, who we get on the panel will, will really dictate kind of that conversation. But I think it's so important to continue these conversations. Um, this stemmed from the AI Los Angeles town hall meeting that, that was on the 9th. And I think we're all just really inspired about talking about, you know, access and equality to education and, um, and careers and, and all of that um, and, and healthcare. So um, it could be a very broad topic, but I think just in general, it would be um, a very interesting discussion. So hopefully we can, you can join us for that. Please look out for the e-blast that we send out um, in a couple of weeks and um, be sure to register for it. Um, so I'd like to now introduce um, Tina Gyorgadze, hopefully I got that right, <laughs> with <Yes>. Perkins and Will. <laughs> Um, to start off our presentation. Hi, uh, I'm Tina. I'm a um, designer at Perkins and Will, and I want to introduce the project and the panelists for today's discussion. We will be uh, reviewing and um, seeing the whole progress for uh, Providence Cedar Sinai, uh, Sinai Tarzana Medical Center uh, project. And our panelists would be Russ Triplett, our managing principal. Uh, we'll have uh, Vince um, Casson, uh, who is uh, Senior Design Construction Manager and Real Estate Strategy Operations for Providence Health and Services. We'll have Eric Chasmore, his Vice President Project Executive for McCarthy Building uh, Companies, and um, Mark Tav Tagawa from Perkins and Will. Uh, he's a design principal on the project and um, He's the, he's the one who designed the project. So I'll hand it off to uh, Vince at this time and he will introduce the project in full. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. My name is Vincent Cassone and I am the representative for Providence Cedar sinai Tarzana Medical Center. I am honored to be here to discuss this amazing project. Um, the Tarzana Reimagine Project is hands down the most intricate and educational project um, I've ever been able to be privileged to work on. Um, you will see with, throughout this presentation that we have construction taking place on all four sides of a functional hospital, multiple locations within the facility, and a large portion of the roof. As a designer myself, there's nothing better to being part of the design process and then building it. As Russ will tell you, we have experienced almost every type of situation on this project. The main building was occupied in 1972, 
before the creation of OSHPOD and the regulatory requirements that we see today. The building has lead, asbestos, mold, manual transfer switches, and an aging central plant. We have had floods, electrical outages, fires, failed generators, failed chillers, a fan coil unit that rips itself to pieces, most of which needed temporary emergency backups, which we all had to jump through hoops to get accomplished. All of these items are due to the aging building and poor maintenance by the previous owners. And these are just a few of the many reasons for all the renovations in the new buildings. And I'd like to thank the team that's helped put this all together. Um, and I will hand this over to Russ. Thanks, Vince. Uh, I'm gonna go, go through and, and tell you some of the stories about the project. As Vince kind of alluded to, this, this project really has multi layers of, of stories and issues and, and um, uh, it's been a real journey. So we're gonna touch on some of the, uh, I hope more interesting elements of the journey. This is our project team. You can see up on the screen there. Uh, I think the, the point here, a few points, you can see the whole team, you can read it yourself, but uh, to, uh, to accentuate um, the project started before us, actually. You can see Taylor Design there. They were actually on the campus working away uh, before we st Perkins Will started in, in a master planning effort, actually. And the, the, the main members of the team, kind of the, the primary members, of course, are structural engineer KPFF and IMEG doing different aspects of the project, Sisk and Hennessy doing MEP systems, and um, you know, KPFF doing civil and Pam Burton on landscape. And, and, um, and of course, McCarthy and their major subs. And I think that's the other, uh, one of the subtexts is, is, is McCarthy came on very shortly after Perkins Will came on to do the master planning effort to start the project and to get cost information and, and help with phasing and, and exploring the different options. Uh, and that led into, and, and Eric's gonna talk about this in much more detail, but it led into really having a robust uh, integrated team uh, where, where some of the subs, some of the major subs actually helping us and uh, do, draw, do our drawings and our designs, or in some cases, executing the designs. We have a real mix of design build, design bid, design bid, uh, design assist, et cetera, in the team. So go to the next slide. So the project is located in the Tarzana neighborhood of Los Angeles. Uh, it, it's, uh, if you're familiar with the San Fernando Valley, it's there near the intersection of the 405 and the, the 101. Uh, we're right next to the freeway. You can see about, about three and a half miles from the 405 there in beautiful Tarzana, California. Go on to the next. So here's our site. Now it's noted as the original site plan because it doesn't look like this anymore. Half these, or one of these buildings are gone. So what you're looking at is uh, to the north, we've got Burbank Boulevard and the 101 freeway you can see there. Uh, to the south, Clark, which is a, a smaller street. Burbank's a little more of a major street. Uh, Reseda Boulevard, uh, just off the just off the screen on the uh, to the west there, and uh, there's our site. Uh, the hospital is the bit that's ringed in red. <laughs> you can see the different building numbers. Those are those are actually the numbers that we uh, assigned with Oshpot. And the, the real key uh, to understanding how the hospital is organized is those three blue buildings. I highlight them a little bit in blue. Those are our original uh, 1972 or so buildings pre Oshpot. Uh, they're all uh, currently SPC-1 buildings. Uh, well, some of them are in SPC-1, but I will uh, tell you why in a little while. And then you can see the additions as they went along. The other buildings, buildings four, five, six, seven, et cetera, all the others actually are compliant buildings. So like many campuses, we have a mix of compliant and non-compliant, buildings that needed to be uh, addressed uh, from SP-953 perspective and buildings that are, were okay structurally. Uh, the original plan for the campus was to upgrade the, these three buildings to SBC2. Uh, when we were brought in was to ask the question, the owner was asking the question, I should say, uh, is that really the right answer for the campus? Uh, we ensure we'd upgrade them, they could live till 2030, but they couldn't live beyond. And we have, uh, besides the, the physical issues that Ben's alluded to, some of the d delayed maintenance and things like that, we had really uh, infrastructure that was aging, as you noted, we have patient rooms that are really uh, era 1972. We have a, a DNT chassis that really didn't have the right mix of services. So while they may have upgraded to and live uh, up until 2030, it really wasn't the right answer. Uh, so that we were brought in about 2013 or, or 2015, excuse me. Um, so one of the challenges was going to be when we come up with whatever the solution is, how are we gonna be able to get it done by our 2020? And I'll go into that in more detail later our 2020 deadline. Um, 
So anyway, but this is where we started. Uh, you can see the existing structure, parking structure, the cube MOB, which is the bane of our planning, because we wanted to grow that way. The, 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 the lease agreement on that building was very problematic. They had some uh, site trailers. And the way that the site is kind of organized is building one uh, has a, is, was the main entrance, main lobby. There was also a building five. You can see there was the entrance to what they call the heart center. And then at building seven, there was another entrance to the women's pavilion. So that's all the perinatal services. Uh, the ED entrance was on the backside, both ambulance and walk-in. Uh, so we, we had kind of a, a site that was a little split. You had to go around back to the ED. You came around the front for the, all the other services. And the beds were kind of split. So building three is mainly where the DNT functions are. Building one was the, the main lobby functions, if you will. Most of the beds are in building two, uh, with the exception of uh, the PICU it is actually an old corner of building three. And then, the, as I said, the perinatal unit in building seven. So we had beds kind of here and there. We had DNT kind of sprinkled throughout. We had building four there, which is a, was a portion of the central plant, uh, aging, et cetera. So the, the campus really has a number of issues with it. So we'll go on to the next slide. So this is to kind of tell the story about the, the plans as they went along. Uh, you can see there we started and the chart is basically the, the, the uh, in 2013, we were under an SB90 extension, which was uh, geared toward by January 1st of 2020, uh, upgrading buildings one, two, and three to SBC2. And that was the project that Taylor was working on and is still working on. Uh, they're still part of the, the team and working on, on uh, the projects that still, which is basically building three. Um, in 2015, uh, we changed that a little bit because of SB, uh, SPC 4D uh, came on the horizon, and then we integrated that originally into buildings one and three, which uh, building one is the lobby building and building three is the DNT. Um, while we, that was when we were doing our master planning work, and that's when it was determined that really the right answer was to build a new, a new patient wing and to replace building one, not upgrade it. Uh, so, the, the next step was to convince the legislature <laughs> that we needed more time to be able to do this. So we embarked on a, a multi, well, there's a whole story to all of this, and I won't get into a lot of detail, um, uh, where we, we as a universal, we went to the legislature, I'm simplifying it greatly, and basically asked, said we need more time. We had got uh, support from Oshpod, uh, David, uh, 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 David Robert, Robert David rather, uh, was supporting these, was, was the director of Oshpod, Paul Coleman, Chris Tokas, et cetera, et cetera, we were all supportive of actually what we wanted to do because they understood that the, the right answer was not just upgrade to SBC2. Um, and so through a lot of effort uh, uh, by various parties, uh, we got AB908, which only basically applied essentially to Tarzana. And that gave us the opportunity to get a couple more years to be able to, to build the, the new patient wing and replace the, the main building and upgrade building three to SBC 4E. Time moved along and then others got the opportunity, the rest of the state basically under AB 2190, uh, to also have an extension beyond 2020 that uh, many of your clients probably are dealing with now. Uh, and so we, we tweak things a little further since it was available and it actually was patterned, if you were to read the two laws, you'd see that they're very similar. Uh, 2190 reads very similar to 908. Um, uh, and so we go, went ahead and used uh, 2190. And so the current uh, compliances were building three, our DNT chassis, which is a two story building, you'll see that in a minute, uh, is going to be upgraded SBC 4D. Building two will be replaced with our new patient wing as an acute care building, we're not tearing it down, but we're, we'll replace it. And you can see those deadlines there that, that we currently have in the regulation. And the building one actually is already compliant because, well, it's gone. <laughs> we took it down because it turned out that it was actually uh, easier, as you can imagine, to upgrade building three if we got rid of building one so we can get to the outside of it and put our, our shear walls in. So there's a, there's a whole dog and pony show there, but we'll keep going. <laughs> So the, the campus, as uh, Ben said, is about 13 acres, built in 72, I think it was finished in 73, but pre-Oshpod. We have about 250, 249 beds currently on the campus, um, about 240,000 square foot MO, uh, hospital, and then you can see the, the other buildings on, on site that were 
uh, in some cases in our way as we as we talked about our, our overall planning. But we ended up with a good master plan, I think, and we'll we'll kind of explain that later. Go to the next slide. So this is by the numbers, if you will, and I think the the you can see the the, the big issues there that to, to show our, our project cost 608 million. That's what it's currently tracking at. And our overall, uh, between renovation and square footage, we have about 71% of the total, the, the, the new total, 455,000 square feet, about 70 some percent of the, pro, of, the, of the campus is being touched. So between our new construction, the patient wing, main entry, et cetera, and all the renovation, we only leave about 100,000 untouched. So a lot of work going on, it's all phased. Um, uh, as it would have to be to stay open. Bless the hearts of all the clinicians who are living through this because it's a long process. So why don't you go on to the next slide. The next slide. There we go. Thank, thanks Russ. Um, I, I just want to say before I jump into the design that while the project was designed in a pre-COVID and pre-George Floyd world, we are beginning to talk to the campus about how we can address, you know, these dual pandemics. And, you know, I really do believe that what we're all going through can really help guide us in creating a, a better project that can address both health and wellness as well as equity and inclusion. Um, you know, that, that being said, what you see up on the screen are the project guiding principles that were created with the hospital leadership as well as leadership from, from Portland. And what everyone was geared towards was creating a, a safe healthcare environment that's envir um, environmentally sensitive and uh, sustainable, as well as flexible. Now, flexible means a lot more today than it did you know, three months ago. Um, but at, you know, at the end of the day, what we wanted to create uh, is the facility that calms and comforts those visiting and those uh, coming um, to the hospital for, for services. The site plan, as Russ had mentioned, if we're starting from the left and moving counterclockwise, the large block in blue is our 600 car garage that got added to the campus that is actually completed at this point in time. Uh, moving to the right, we have the new main entry and the new front door to the hospital in that um, sideways T shape. And we also have a, an expansion of the DNT on the far right. Now, while the campus has quite in a um, somewhat large area that has been on that was undeveloped there really was only one true location for a new patient tower which is on the north side of the site and that's also being hemmed in by the the property and its adjacency to the on-ramp uh, heading east for the 101. So as we began looking at the the shape of the tower what it really meant um, given the conditions of the site and what we could actually do with it, we really started to shape it according to what the site was telling us and, and also really what the context was telling us, you know, how it can move and position itself along the highway and become a, a new front door and a new uh, uh, signature piece for the campus itself. As we're looking at the site, Russ touched on this um, earlier, we, we created a, a better clarity between the public side versus the, the service side of the campus with the new additions to the, to the hospital. So we have the main entry in a similar location, but rather than the public ED entrance being on the back side, we pulled that over to the west side of the site. Also uh, keeping, maintaining the ambulance entry on the, the east as well as service on the east. So we really try to separate both public and service um, using the hospital as a barrier between the, the two. And you can see how the, the new tower as well as the new front door to the building really are quite large additions to the overall uh, existing hospital. As far as circulation, um, public vehicular circulation is uh, very similar to the front door coming off of Clark 
you can also come off of Burbank uh, for the emergency vehicular traffic. The intent will be to primarily come off of Burbank to the north with a side entrance for ambulances to come off of Burbank and actually drive underneath the, the building, which is the primary reason for the cantilever on the north edge of the um, facade. Service access to the hospital remains in a similar condition um, because of the, just because of the, the nature of the existing uh, service location and the central plant. And pedestrian access from the parking garages um, provide you easy access to both the front door of the ED as well as the front door of the, the hospital. Staff circulation from the, the new parking garage will be very similar and we have a separate entry for them um, at the front door. So the, the campus is truly represent, the existing campus is truly representative of its time when it was constructed. It, the two uh, towers that you see here, the one on the left is an existing MLB. The one on the right is their existing bed tower. And they are both um, clad in dark bronze mullions as well as dark bronze tinted glazing. And going through the design process, I found out that I was really the only one that truly appreciated and liked the dark bronze um, appearance of the existing structure. So we began looking at a different way of acknowledging that and complementing the campus without being completely disrespectful to what's there and what will remain on the, on the campus. So we looked at a series of ribbon windows that will um, move its way around the building and pull, its, pull together the, the campus as a singular whole. A view of the new courtyard that uh, we created with the, the way the new patient tower embraces a, uh, a found space between itself and the women's pavilion. One thing that was lacking with the existing site were, were really outdoor environments for patients and staff to really use as locations to decompress and to really just relax outside. A view looking to the east of the San Fernando Valley, you can see the new parking garage in the foreground with the existing MOB and the existing patient tower to the right and our new patient wing off um, in the back uh, adjacent to the 101. We've also been looking at the way the parking garages as well as the rest of the campus address the public right of way. And one of the questions the city had was that they didn't want, as many of you know, the city does not like parking garages to look like a parking garage. And we even had some comments saying that they wanted it they wanted our new parking garage to look just like the existing bed tower, which we didn't see um, any sense in doing, but we wanted to um, illustrate a graphic on what the actual landscaping was gonna look like when you're standing along. So this is a view along Burbank Avenue looking to the south, and there are multiple layers of trees before you even can uh, visually see the actual parking garage from the sidewalk to the, um, the site. Uh, where the garages are located. Image, the image to the left is a view heading east along Burbank. You can see the tower in the background along with the parking garage to the right, our ED, our public ED drop off to the right, and our new front door to um, the main hospital. And as Russ pointed out, our, our new front door collects the previous three separate entries and pulls them into a, a larger lobby that provides a single point of entry for everyone uh, moving into the, uh, walking into the hospital. Views from the parking garage headed to the patient tower between the existing MLB and a bird's eye view hovering above the 101 looking back uh, towards the, the campus. And as you're driving along the on-ramp um, headed east uh, to the 101, 
you will uh, you will have a clear view of the undercut of the building that I pointed out earlier, which serves as ambulance access to the back side of the hospital. With the interior design, um, you, we have all these different pieces of the hospital coming together and it created quite a bit of a challenge circulation wise to really make some sense out of everything. So the, the color diagram that you see in beige represents the, the public access uh, circulation uh, within the ground floor uh, of the building. And what we're trying to do is develop a way to have the interior complement the, the architecture. Also, given the fact that we have multiple structures that were built over a number of years, um, really decades, and along with new buildings that were being added, so there was just an abundance of columns within the location. So our approach became to rather than fight the, the nature of the columns, really to use the columns as a wayfinding element and use them almost as uh, breadcrumbs to move you from one part of the building to, to the other. So the columns became celebrated and while they may not appear rational in plan, they, they start to offer uh, another layer of interest and uh, a key to wayfinding as you move through the space through its texture and through its color. We wanted to inject warmth and color into the interior palette and with a base and framework that was, was very elegant and quiet and calm and also looking towards the garden for inspiration and the, the new flowering plants that we have there. We decided to use that to pull color uh, from the planting and from the, the flowering uh, plants that are going to be incorporated into the garden and around the campus as accent colors for the, the project itself. And how that can work with a, a neutral palette uh, that you see off to the, the left. The typical approach would really be to assign a single color per floor, but what we decided to do was provide every single accent color on every floor with the idea that one accent color would be the primary accent color. So as you can see in this diagram, the accent, the primary accent color shifts as you move up the building, but you would really pull together the entire uh, color palette of the project. And adding additional color to the pediatric floor, which is on the second floor, and even looking at ways on introducing graphics into it. So the graphics start to, Pull, it, pull the project together and also distinguish itself for the children's floor. So back to the initial diagram that uh, was up earlier, the, the planning, the color, the accents, and the, the wayfinding all lead you to the vertical circulation for the build, the public vertical circulation for the building, whether it is in our new entry pavilion or the women's pavilion uh, to the upper left or our new patient tower. And how that can begin to radiate its color and gradate as you move away from the uh, elevator core into the body of the building. Along with um, patient only service um, access uh, moving up and down within the, the tower as well as the DNT chassis. So as you step into the front door of the new hospital, we created a double height volume to better provide uh, a better sense of arrival as you walk into the, the main lobby. And um, well, and you'll be lead, led to the women's pavilion on the, the left, as well as a new admitting and reception area on the right. Our new chapel, which is just further in from the front door of the facility. And our, our new ED, again, picking up uh, some of the softer elements of the architecture and introducing that into the design of the interior.
on the pediatric floor, uh, this begins your ascent into the, the building with a waiting area right off of the public elevators and we have a children's playroom uh, within the, the floor itself. Images of our uh, renovated NICU. With, this is this is actually within the existing hospital itself, not a part of the new patient tower. And the new patient floors, uh, this being the pediatric floor with the adult ICU and adult med, med surge floors being very similar. Uh, with uh, different primary accent colors being introduced and highlighted. So kind of to tag on to Mark's explanation of kind of from a building and interior design perspective, how the project was approached from a planning, uh, the planning response to that, if you will, that went hand in hand. Um, go to the next slide and I'll, I'll kind of I'll walk us through what we were thinking and what the real issues were. So this is our, this is basically the master plan. And what, what you, as you, as you might have guessed <laughs> from all the previous present information is you can see the, the, the patient wing there at the, on the north, uh, the new main lobby that'll be start, actually start physical construction very shortly. Right now there's nothing there, it's a big hole. Uh, the uh, upgrade of the uh, ancillary wing uh, build, what we call building three there, and which has the you know, yellow on it. The DNP expansion, which is another phase. In other words, that actually it's in the middle of plan check right now. And then along the edge there, a portion of the central plant on the site. And as Mark says, the, the, the way the building's organized now is uh, all the beds are on the north side. They're not split up like they were. Uh, with Williams Pavilion on one side, and, and then the new patient wing, all the other beds. The DNT, um, uh, the ancillary, or the ancillary ring, wing has now all the support and diagnostic and treatment functions uh, adjacent to the, the, the bed tower. So it's a, it's a much clearer and uh, more um, efficient way to organize the building, uh, uh, even though it's been built over many years. So go to the next slide. Yeah, so here's our stack. And on the right side of the stack, you can, in the, in the, in the narrative there, you can see how the breakdown by floor, and we'll go through each floor. So you don't have to dwell on that. But uh, on the left side, you can see just the tally of our licensed beds. So all those beds are new, except for those 29 perinatal and the 21 NICU. As, as Mark said, uh, the NICU is being renovated very carefully, actually, because uh, if we do too much, then it triggers upgrades um, uh, and we'd lose beds. So those, those 21 beds and the, and, the, and the 29 beds are actually existing, all the others are in, in the new building uh, or new beds so for a total of 200 beds, uh, the, which is actually less than, if you notice, from the beds that they, they started with. Uh, and the, the real thing was uh, actually when we started with a KSA had done a various analysis, um, now ECG, um, and it was really determined that that was the right uh, balance of, of bed need for the community. At, linked with a, an approach to address the deficiencies in the DNT functions. In other words, we needed more ORs, we needed more PACU, we needed a, really a different DNT chassis. And, and of course, all these beds are all private. And so we're able to be much more efficient in our, our bed utilization. So we'll go to the next slide and I'll start to walk us through the building. So uh, we, have a, we have a basement in the patient wing. Uh, we have some soil issue. There are really two reasons for this. One is, as Mark said, there wasn't a lot of room for on the site for, let's say, a new central plant building. Um, and so it made sense to just go down. We also had soil, poor soil conditions, so it made sense from that perspective also. So we have our base, our pharmacy down here in the basement, some storage, and kind of half of our central plant, if you will. So that's what's in our basement. As we step up in the building, this is where, of course, it gets a little more complicated. So Mark alluded to the, that path, and you can see that the, circuit, the main circulation for the patient wing there at the north is in the middle of the bar. Uh, it's one of the challenges. How do we get folks to the middle? How do we get uh, uh, our circulation? The green circulation, those elevators are the public. The red are a back house, either, either staff or patient. Uh, and so uh, uh, it comes down 
in kind of in the middle of the ED here at this level. Uh, the, the public side gets you access up to the beds above. The, the, the light blue line, I hope you can see, is actually the limits of the new construction. So that's our edge of our new patient wing. There's our edge as Mark traces it down on the, on the DNT, which like I said, isn't start, started yet. And then there's the, the main lobby building. So, so as Mark was saying, you know, the, the new lobby goes right to the middle of uh, the new lobby building, goes through the middle of the new lobby and the rest is existing. So there's, there's, as he says, there's columns sitting in the middle there, you know, facing columns, expansion joints, et cetera, uh, in that space. So you can see on this graphic, the, the consolidation of the entries make it much simpler. It's the separation of, of, of service on the, on the back side, ambulance and then public on the front side, on the more public side of the building. The colors, by the way, are, uh, represent renovation or new construction. So you can get a sense of how much we're kind of fussing with this, this building by how much color there is. So we have the, the ED on the first level of the new patient wing, our new lobby in the, in the new lobby main building, uh, as Mark had alluded to, our admitting, and then some outpatient services, mainly outpatient, the GI lab, heart center, and new med down in that corner. And then the SBD uh, gets replaced in a new location, which will be which is adjacent. You can kind of see it there um, with with the um, uh, cath labs and uh, at this level, and then directly under the surgical floor when we go to the next floor um, uh, the, to service directly up. Uh, and then our existing dietary, we do actually have some work to the kitchen that we need as part of the project. And then and then of course the DNT expansion, which includes. Um, uh, additional materials management and uh, ex some more expansion of the uh, receiving and uh, sterile processing department. I think one, one thing ad additional to note, Russ, with the ED is that we've tripled the size of the ED from their current one. Uh, they had they actually had beds within the hallway um, as they were admitting uh, folks into the ED. So this footprint that you see is three times the size that the existing hospital uh, was previously accommodated with. Yeah, when we toured Robert David, the director of Oshpod, through the building, as we were trying to convince him to kind of support this, this le the legislature to give us more time to allow us to do this, uh, we walked through the ED. <laughs> and I think that was one of the things that, that helped us. He looked and said, oh my gosh, you got to get out of here. You need, this community needs more, uh, needs more care, more um, uh, facilities to, to support the, the community. And so uh, I think that was one of the big things. As you move up to the second level, again, you look at this graphic, squint your eyes, all that color is, is the work we're doing. So it's, we're, again, we're touching a lot. So as we move up to this level, this basically is our pediatric level adjacent to the, the, women's, um, uh, the women's floors on the other side, uh, the birthing floors. And so we have our PICU, eight beds, our pediatric unit of 16 beds. And again, that circulation, uh, public circulation right in the middle of the floor, but the connection back, which they don't have now actually, uh, from one side of the campus at this level to the other side, there actually is no through, through uh, circulation. When we're done, there will be, and they'll be able to move back and forth. So we're expanding also the, you know, as part of the DNT expansion, some imaging, MRI, CT, um, our PACU to support the expanded uh, surgical functions. You can see down there in the lower uh, corner about the, we're modernizing the, the whole surgical department, leaving some of the older, ORs alone, we'd love to cut the whole thing, but we don't have all the money in the world. Um, and we have to stay operational, but w w do the, the idea is to really change the focus of the campus to have more surgical capacity, again, in response to the community need. And then outpatient um, pre and post over on the other side of the second level of the um, uh, main lobby expansion. And then the old tower will eventually, of course, be de-licensed. Uh, there'll be a RACS project to do that, and then we haven't quite figured it out yet, but it'll be uh, support functions, non-acute care functions, I'll say non-24, uh, Tower 24 acute care functions go into that building. I'm sure they'll fill it right up. So then, so most of the campus, as you note here, now we're at the third level, and we fall away. So the, most of the campus is only two levels high. We had the old patient tower that was, that keeps going up, and then our new tower that goes up. And this is our, uh, basically our ICU and DOU, we've got a med surge 
or definitive observation unit uh, at this level, 11 bed ICU, 11 bed CBICU, and then that 20 bed uh, DLU unit. And then we keep going up on the, on the old tower, it's levels four, five, six. On the new building, it's levels four and five, uh, uh, both uh, a 22 bed and a 20 bed uh, med surge unit on, on either end of each floor. That's kind of how the building's organized. Uh, uh, all private rooms, all modern rooms. Um, uh, we were having a lot of discussion about uh, COVID and, and potential um, ability to surge in these existing spaces. We'll be exploring that kind of in, the coming, in the coming weeks. Hey, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the project execution and um, we're gonna focus on the schedule and our design assist and design build pre-construction efforts. So Mark, if you go to the first slide for me. So from a schedule overview, um, while this is one project, you have the reimagined project, um, it's actually 17 contracts for us and eight of which we've already completed the work on. We've got six that are in progress and three that are in the future. From an overall perspective, the, uh, the time frame on the project is October of 2017 and taking us into August of 2024. So a long project, um, and in, in there, we've got listed, uh, you know, the four major elements of the project um, and, and their time frame. So building three seismic and patient wing underway with new building one and the D&T building uh, starting up uh, one later this year and D&T a little further out once we get past the patient wing. Yeah, we have, there's currently a, about 20 open Oshpod projects between Make Ready Work the, the collaborative uh, uh, incremental project uh, approval for the patient wing, uh, incremental for building uh, the main building. Uh, the, <laughs> if you, we have free or manual stuff, we have field reviews, we've, we've got program flexes that you can't believe, uh, very complex, but I think this is just touching on that. So a couple unique things about the schedule. Um, you know, currently we are tracking 475 fragnets in our schedule. And if you're not familiar with the term fragnet, that's really um, a way that we tag and track changes to our original plan or baseline schedule. Uh, so one, it helps us communicate that out and track uh, for both our subcontractor partners, for the owner, and as well as for the design team. Um, it's a very high number, but as Vince mentioned earlier, you know, we are currently working on all four sides of the hospital on top of the existing building and inside the building all at once. And if we, we can't come up with a clean and clear way on a weekly basis to communicate to the facilities who's trying to continue to operate and treat patients among all of that work that you can see there in the slide, um, it, it's not going to be a good patient experience. So what, what really I think you learn from this is on a project where you are as invasive as we are on this particular one, it is, it's critical that you remain flexible, um, that you have a high level of attention to detail, and that you've got a good path to communicate out. Each of these projects, while they may be their own permit and their own contract, all have some level of interconnectivity. And as each project is working through its own unique and individual challenges, whether it's existing conditions um, or, or anything else, little adjustments in those can start to ripple into other projects. And so really, um, you know, that 475 fragments has been a tremendous effort by pretty much everyone on the team to try and keep the communication level where it needs to be. So Providence understands where we're going to be, how we're going to impact their operations, as well as how we can remain flexible and adjust so they can continue to take, uh, you know, treat patients here. Yeah, and another good example, you know, as mentioned, you know, the, the fragments and the flexibility is, is COVID. Um, COVID was unexpected and has completely changed the dynamics of this project. Um, we had to shift gears pretty quick um, within the first few weeks. Not only had, do we have to get the facility prepared for the surge, um, but we had to calm the fears of our workers and our, our staff. 
Um, we were fortunate that the hospital itself is a, is a sterile environment and actually safer than going to your local supermarket. Um, within the first few weeks, we had to set up triage tents in the first floor of our old parking structure. Um, we quickly had to rebuild some of the areas that we had occupied um, in order to do our seismic work. Um, we actually shifted, um, the, the facility actually shifted their ICU to their existing PICU, which we had at one point occupied, and then turned their existing ICU into a COVID unit. Um, we were able to do all of this with OSHPOD and CDPH. Um, these agencies actually allowed us to make these changes without a plan check or even a site walk. Um, as a precaution, we have halted some of the work within the facility, but uh, you know, not only for the construction workers, but also to allow the facility to do what they do best, and that's actually treat the community in which they serve um, without the distraction of construction. Um, so we are still proceeding with investigations in, in many areas within the facility, um, so we're ready to hit the ground running once this pandemic is over um, and, and allow us to remain flexible to moving back into those spaces when it is safe to do so. Yeah, I mean, that, that's just a great example of one of the fragments that we've had to add into the schedule to, to keep our subs uh, apprised of how the project's changing, how we're adapting to whatever challenge or unforeseen condition that you know, we happen to get thrown at us. Um, another really key element uh, to help really the entire team was dropping in the OSHPOD calendar into our schedule. You know, in the beginning stages of the project, we did not have OSHPOD out here every week. We had certain people out here every week, but other people were every other week. And as we were trying to plan through, you know, it, it's easy for us to keep our eye on when do we need answers or when do we need approvals to support construction. But you also have to slide the bar forward a little bit of when do we, when do we have an opportunity to get an approval to support construction. And with the schedules kind of as, as being in flux as they were, you know, dropping those into our schedules and linking any kind of activity through the OSHPOT approval calendar really helped the entire team. It helped us communicate to Perkins and Will uh, when we needed information. It helped them uh, keep an eye on that it wasn't really just what they're seeing in the schedule, but a, another date beforehand if we were going to keep things moving along. So a couple metrics. Um, just high level of the schedule. Currently, we have a little over 17,000 activities in our schedule. Um, that includes 4,000 activities that we added through this FragNet process. So, to, you know, if you think about it, before we added those in, we had about 13,000. We've added almost another third of our original plan of additional detail into the schedule as we've worked through coordinating with facilities, adjusting to their needs, and dealing with the, the challenges as they've come up. Kind of another interesting uh, statistic on our schedule, if you look at the picture here, this is a pretty recent picture of our hole. It's only maybe about a week old. Um, you know, in our schedule right now for the patient wing, we have 29 weeks from the start of our foundation, which this represents almost the end of it, to the topping out of steel. And on the patient wing, from the topping out of steel to completion, we've got 104. So while it might look like in this picture that we're not very far along, um, in a very short window, we're gonna have uh, the framework of the tower standing there and interior build out will begin. So we're actually just a couple months away. Um, and when you think about the road that this project has been on from, you know, Russ talking about back in 2015, and we're working towards a, uh, completion date in, 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 in just a couple years here, we're actually way beyond halfway through on this project, even though it looks like it's just getting started. So from a design assist and pre-construction effort, I wanted to kind of just give you guys a, a high level overview of it. So this is a list of our partners that we have on board helping us. Um, also covers the, uh, the scope that they're working on. Uh, and Shuff Steel, while they, while they weren't a true design assist partner, they were a trade that we onboarded early. Um, it was a means to help, uh, if you recall, call, before there was COVID, there was tariffs. 
and in a way of trying to mitigate and control the risk through tariffs, we, we brought Chef Steel on board to help uh, procure, figure out what, what we could buy, lock that material down. And as well, because we did have them on board, it allowed them to get a head start, um, start seeing what we were doing through coordination, as well as uh, asking questions in the design and getting the, the process ready. So while not an official DEA partner, uh, definitely one in spirit. Well, and, the, and these DEA partners weren't just providing some kind of general input. They were actually, uh, the MEP, and I think I noted this, were actually doing the drawings. That Siska and Hennessy was overseeing the work, developing the designs, but the, the plans themselves that went to Hodgepod, in essence, the shop drawings that they were going to build off of, uh, uh, to do their, their finite coordination, et cetera, gross coordination of finite, were developed by Murray, Control Air, and Rosenin uh, under the direction of uh, Siskin and Hennessy. And this is similar with uh, performance contracting on the uh, drywall framing, et cetera. We were working hand in glove with them to develop the details about how they want to build those walls so that when we get out to the field, they can just execute, uh, just execute the project. And then the same, same thing with the uh, design build trade partners where we established the, the design of the exterior uh, skin system from an aesthetic perspective. This is what we want the materials to be and how we want it to look. And we work closely with them to actually execute the, the where they execute the actual documents and that went into Oshpa to get approval. So a very integrated team is the point. It started very, very early. I can go to the next one for me, Mark. So, um, what are the key elements of the DA process? You know, you saw the list of who we've got on board. Um, it was really a targeted existing condition investigation to help support the design and figure out what, what we were working with from an, from an original starting point. It was constructability reviews of the documents. Um, there was the modeling, which was the, the genesis for moving forward, uh, as Russ was just saying, into the document generation for what gets submitted to Oshpod and uh, as well as cost management. Um, while not originally part of the, the pre-con effort, one thing that we did start implementing and we, we saw the value in it was virtual mock-ups. So, you know, we look at plans every day and things that might be intuitive to us in 2D, looking at elevation and plan view, um, may not be as, as intuitive to others. So, you know, in this picture, we've got one of the medical providers in the VR mock-up looking at it and, and converting that 2D space into a 3D, you know, environment that she can interact in. That with those hand controls, she can move things around. She can reach to touch elements. Um, so it, it was really a great opportunity. Uh, we, we've got four rooms that we've done the virtual mock-up with. Um, not only to share and, and get feedback from the from the, the end users, but as well as from the design team on, you know, as we built this model, you know, are we envisioning, envisioning your design correctly? You know, it, it was a great feedback tool for us. It was also a, a very good tool for the, for the facility itself. We've used these VR mock-ups for foundation meetings, um, for, for, getting on donations and, you know, sharing this information with the community. Um, it has been very beneficial to us with, you know, getting the community really excited about the project and the, the you know, overall benefit that it's going to help throughout the community that it serves. I would also add that beyond the virtual mock-ups, we did have, we, we did construct um, physical mock-ups of the, the patient rooms and so they, they were being used simultaneously. And as Vince alluded to, the foundation really latched on to the, um, the location where we have built the actual mock-ups to hold uh, foundation events, fundraising events that we've, um, we've assisted um, in maintaining and assisted the foundation uh, with, their, uh, with their schedule. Okay. So um, a couple, couple benefits from the, uh, the DADB process. One you could probably plan or hope to get out of it and one that you probably didn't expect. 
So in this picture, um, this is looking back at the original uh, building three. And, you know, th this is what we all call the pipe rack, but essentially in order to provide um, new utility routings to the existing buildings that were going through the space that needed to be excavated for the tower, the utilities have been rerouted up onto the top of the existing buildings to where they branch out and then drop back down into the building. So if you can imagine, you've got a, a, a building that was not designed to carry this load um, on a post-tension deck that doesn't leave you a lot of flexibility um, and working in and around existing uh, utilities that need to remain operational, um, it, it was a real challenge. And this did not start as a, uh, a portion of the job that was design assist or design build but it was definitely a portion of the job that received a benefit from it. By having a team that was already, had already formed, had been working together in a collaborative environment, and that also happened to be working on the make ready portions as well, you know, we were able to leverage that team into helping figure out solutions to making this happen. And uh, this has probably been one of the more complicated utility routings that, I, that I've ever seen or had a pro, uh, ability to be a part of. But uh, one of the other benefits that we received, you know, as, as pre-con was going on, was that we were really able to um, get an early read on the deck loading. And from a uh, Missy Metals perspective, you know, through getting that feedback and having Shuff on board, we were able to significantly reduce the amount of miscellaneous or supplemental steel that we were going to expect to see as the towers developed. Because we had that information early, we were able to kind of drive that in back into the primary design and minimize the amount of steel um, that would need to be bought out later through a, through a Missy Metal package. We were able to incorporate that into the main frame of the, of the building to begin with. So project status, I'm just gonna run you uh, through a few pictures of uh, where we currently are and where we've been. So these are uh, some examples of our completed projects. You know, you've heard uh, Russ and Mark talk a bit about them. You got the parking structure up on the top right, uh, the interim canopy uh, that was in the front right next to building one and uh, the women's pavilion. It's, and then you've it's, got- It's called interim, but it's actually the final. <laughs> we, there was a reason we called it interim canopy. That was a little yeah. bit of a shell game. <laughs> And then you got the, uh, the interim pharmacy as well. So, you know, examples of work that we've done outside the building, right up against the building and inside as well. Uh, we've got the start of the patient wing. This photo is about a little over a week old. You can see over on the, uh, the right hand or the west side of the building, uh, some of the rebar. That, that was our fourth and final foundation pour. And that's taken place. Uh, we've got the start of the uh, perimeter walls. That'll be wrapping up in about another five weeks or so. And all in preparation for steel to start in August. So it won't be long uh, before the end of the year, we'll have this frame up and uh, beginnings of the building will be standing there. So I wanted to, to jump in here and, and just as a, as a kind of a, a fun fact, as part of our EIR, we were actually required to have an archaeologist, a paleontologist, and the old local Indian tribe, the Kazi Nation, on site whenever we dig. Um, luckily, we haven't found anything that would stop the project, but we have found some fossils that were marine organisms that lived about 10 million years ago. Um, we also found a few trash pits, and because of the age, they actually had to be hand dug and itemized, um, which did slightly delay the project, but we were able to work around that. Um, some of the artifacts found in the pit included glass medicine bottles um, dating back to the 1938 um, and other bottles that, that range between 1920 and 1960. Um, they literally had to itemize, you know, leftover um, food, chicken bones, um, different types of items um, throughout <laughs> this, this trash pit. So it was pretty interesting to see that process. So this is new building one or the, the, the beginnings of preparing for new building one. This is the original building one. Um, but it really kind of illustrates how tight of a site it is that we're working with. Um, you know, in the first picture, it, 
I think you'd have probably a hard time drawing a line as what, what is building one and what is not. And as we've kind of slowly chipped away at the building, leaving everything else that's left, um, you know, it was an extremely tight site, a uh, lot of challenges and, and great communication with Providence in terms of allowing us to kind of do something that's that disruptive, that close to their existing buildings and plan to work through without any interruption. Um, actually got this whole building down in just a couple weeks and it, was, it went extremely smooth for how, how challenging it could have been uh, being that close to where occupied spaces were. There's a big shear wall that's going in at the back of that. Yep. <laughs> and, that and, that's the, <laughs> and the starts of that shear wall are right there in the upper right hand corner. So that back wall that we had just exposed through the through demoing building one, this is this is an up close shot of that back wall uh, where you can see that the new foundations, um, shear walls and, and beams that are going in as part of the seismic upgrade of building three. Um, Really, these walls are all around the existing building. So you can see in the pictures down below, those are a couple other examples uh, from elsewhere along the project where we're adding these shear walls to the existing building. And, and frankly, these, these pictures don't do it justice. I mean, some of those things that we've had to do is wheeling in a beam into uh, an ED department. And you can imagine if you'd remove the ceiling of an ED department and looked up and the amount of utilities. Now imagine taking that beam and raising that up and attaching it to the deck. Um, we're forming and pouring new beams within those occupied spaces. Um, it's, it's been really impressive how well this team's been able to work together and to coordinate to allow us to come in and do such intrusive work within their hospital and still maintain uh, you know, operational functions. So lessons learned. I, I think that there. I think if you ask any of us, well, I have probably different answers to this question. Um, one of the big lessons learned for uh, for me was really never, never, <laughs> never stopping to ask the question: uh, Is it possible on the project? Uh, all the, the the way to get what we wanted uh, to get to the endpoint was just to bring everybody along. So whether that was uh, Robert David to bring in him along and legislatures legis or, or, you know, Oshpod folks to say, look, this is the right answer for the community, for the hospital, to the, the entitlements we had to go through, which were, we had every possible thing you could do to the program flexibility request that made the, the ability to actually keep uh, some elements of the hospital open, moving a NICU into an ICU, um, moving the PICU into a PEDS unit, things that, um, just weren't didn't sound very feasible, but we kept asking the question bring people along with you and and you can it's amazing what you can do. Agreed and and from the facility side, you know, and lessons learned for, for Providence as a whole is you're really doing an assessment of our existing utilities and trying to get an understanding of what items you know, are, are nearing end of life, which items do we need to be prepared to back up if something happens. Um, you know, just something as simple, as simple as shutting off a breaker could have, you know, long lasting results. So just making sure that there's an assessment in place and, you know, a knowledge of what's going to take place moving forward. I would just add that on a, on a project like this, you know, probably the biggest lesson learned would be to expect the unexpected. Um, be ready for it. Try to plan for it. You know, I think we spend so much time trying to put together the perfect plan. Um, but it, it's just, it's not going to happen on a, on a job like this. You just have to be flexible, um, be ready to react and, and do so with great communication with, with good partners. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, you know, being nimble has been key to the success of this project. Um, you know, Russ mentioned that we started back in 2015 I think we finally settled on a master plan direction, I believe in towards the end of the year, um, had some semblance of an idea of the, the planning and the overall size of the building in March of 16. And I think 
within six or eight weeks, our land use attorney wanted to begin the entitlement process. So we needed to complete the design of this hospital really within less than two months, the, the architecture of it, just to get it within, get it into the city of LA. And that entitlement process ended up taking two years. So we had to really be quick on decision-making, be nimble with the design and the, our interaction with the, the campus administration as well as leadership um, of the healthcare system. I think um, I just wanted to add uh, that if anyone is interested um, and you take out, you can take out your smartphone and um, with, with your camera, take a picture of the QR code, it will kick you to a link that will provide you with not necessarily VR, but 360 degree views of several locations around the, the campus. And we created this for the ceremonial groundbreaking that we had in February of this year. So you'll be able to kind of spin around um, several locations around the, the campus. And I believe we have a few interior shots in there as well. So I'll leave this I'll, I'll leave this up on the screen for a little bit while um, if people are interested and want to play around with that. <clears throat> so to, to con conclude the presentation, you know, um, I'd like to say that, you know, this, this has been a challenging yet reporting project to work on. Um, it remains full of complexities that are constantly shifting around existing conditions, the patients and the staff and the global environment that we are currently in. You know, when we when we started this project, we never expected anything like COVID or the civil unrest, um, you know, when we were putting the development of this project together. And it has really made us look at our approach differently. Um, we have overcome so many obstacles on this project and it is still thriving. And in the end, it will be the beautiful facility that will serve the community for many years to come. We have too many partners to name all. Um, so I would like to conclude in thanking Providence, Cedar sinai Pacific Ironclad, Perkins and Will and McCarthy, as well as all the other companies that work hard daily to make this project a, a success. Um, and thank you all, and I hope you have a, a great evening, and I'll go ahead and open it up for questions. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, Eric, I'll just help get this Q&A started. Um, so we still have 76 people um, on this call, um, which is great, and we have a lot of questions. Um, we'll try to um, wrap this up in 15 minutes, but we might go a little over. Um, so again, if you have a question, you can put it in the chat box and I'll read it off or I'll ask you to say your question in the group or you can use the um, raise hand feature and we'll um, start a queue there. So I actually went back um, to the chat and earlier on there was a question from Carl Sonnenberg. Um, Carl, you had a question on the exterior and notice the gold and bronze window trim and fins. Um, and wondered if Mark can elaborate on that section a little bit more. So Carl, you wanna unmute yourself um, if you wanna elaborate on that question. Uh, I think that just says it. Uh, I just noticed the gold and I was wondering if he had mentioned he liked the 1970 buildings and wondered if it was a nod to those. That's all, thank you. Carl, yes, it, it was absolutely a nod to the, the dark bronze. Um, of the existing hospital. Uh, we thought as a design team, a, a softer approach would be a nice complement to the, the campus without being completely foreign, uh, a foreign intervention. So the, while we were trying to, we, we saw a number, we brought in a number of samples into the office, trying to look at ways on achieving a, a really brilliant gold, golden hue to the glass, what we were also concerned was with was how that would feel being um, bathed in that kind of colored light coming into the facility. So we're looking at a number of ways at achieving uh, the color. One was um, a two-tone um, laminate with a color on the exterior and it would be rather neutral on the interior so you wouldn't have that gold coming through. Um, and bathing the interior space in a, a golden hue. Uh, we ended up with a, um, 
colored ceramic frit uh, that we are utilizing to, to achieve a, um, a softer golden beige color for the facility. Cool. Um, so next we had a question from Ron Radina. Um, Ron, if you want to unmute yourself, um, how early were the DA trades brought into the project? 50% and Ron, if you want to elaborate, you can unmute yourself. I, I think Grady answered the question. Uh, the trades were brought on at 100% DD. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, and I, was, I, the I exterior, was, was the exterior a delegated design? Yeah, the exterior subs were design build. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and, I, and I'll say, Ron, uh, I, I would have, we would have preferred to actually be brought on earlier, uh, maybe like 50% DD. Uh, yeah, I, th I think that's a lesson learned too, that we, it would have been great to actually get started leaving a little earlier. Yeah, especially with all that uh, early investigation that uh, yeah. Eric talked about. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, and please feel free to say move on if you've already gone over this. Um, uh, Henry asked any prefabrication components. Uh, we did have some prefabrication that we used on building three seismic, mostly the uh, the roof rack structure that all of those uh, pipe racks and, and utilities sat on. Um, you know, part of it was an opportunity that as we were working through some of the challenges caused by the PT deck, uh, we were able to kind of continue to march on and actually fabricate and bring things out in bigger pieces to drop them in. Um, it was a little bit risky because we did have a lot of challenges with existing uh, deck loading that was getting evaluated, um, making sure that we weren't overloading an existing deck that wasn't designed to carry that load. Um, and then when you, as you're starting to lay things out, finding where all the PT cables are that's requiring you to make slight adjustments. But um, overall, it, it did work out well and it allowed us to kind of make up some time on the schedule. Great. Um, okay, William Chu, do you want to unmute yourself for your question you had earlier um, if uh, there was one or two limiting as build conditions? Uh, yeah, I know you mentioned and somewhere in the presentation that there were some uh, as built conditions that were uh, sort of a, a drag on the project. I'm just wondering if there was any lessons learned from the prior built condition that you would avoid. Yeah, wow, where, where do we start? Uh, <laughs> I would start with PT cables in the hospital. Yes, there's one. Don't do it. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the building was, you know, the, th the buildings one, two, and three, and of course were built originally, and they were of fair size, but then all the other additions, except for the limbs, were quite small. And so that, you know, dealing with all those, they're structurally separate which means we have columns next to columns. Uh, we have, you know, seismic joints that uh, are difficult to fire rate, et cetera. Um, you know, utilities traversing all that. It's a pain <laughs> to, to deal with. Uh, also, just from an overall planning perspective, a two-story building, not really the, the most efficient use of the campus. Um, that'd be my critique to the original planners that, you know, you had the you had the, the tower, and then you had two story buildings, and then you in, when you did Williams Pavilion, you just kept that going. So you kind of used up a lot of the site. Uh, the other the other one is it really wasn't a planning issue; it was more of a I'll say a financial issue. Is that that MOB across the the, the driveway there has like a ninety nine year lease, so it's not going anywhere, and that might have been like a good spot to to grow out in that direction. Uh, as opposed to the north, uh, or you might have uh, had maybe a good idea to go in both directions, but it just wasn't on the table. So uh, we were just pretty hemmed in. I also think it's interesting to know, you know, we when looking at our as builds, most of them, first off, weren't very um, accurate. And we found that, you know, some of the, the routing for a lot of our equipment runs from one building to another. So we had the, the when we took down building one, we had things that were from building eight that were feeding building seven and things from building three that are serving building two. And so trying to coordinate all of those utilities, you know, definitely was uh, was fun to overcome. Um, but I think that was one of the, the big examples is, is, you know, 
the proper routing for this equipment, you know, and not having it go through a, a building to serve another building. Interesting. Okay, I'm going to keep going along um, with these questions and hopefully we'll get to most of them. Um, and I'm so sorry, I don't want to mispronounce this name, but Ji Xiao um, from ZGF, you had two questions. Um, if you want to unmute yourself um, and elaborate on them. No? Okay. I'm going to ask them. It says, uh, the first question is, is any unique challenge by having the, oh no, I don't know what this, cantil, oh no, what is, what is it? Cantilever. Cantilever. <laughs> Sorry guys, I can read. On the north side. Oh, there you are. Oh, hey, sorry. Uh, I was unmuting on my phone, but I forgot I have to do that on my computer as well. Oh, okay. Uh, first is regarding exterior. Uh, I think it's a brilliant solution to having a cantilever to create a driving way on the north to deal with the site restriction. Um, I'm just curious, is there any unique challenge the team experienced and license and learn that you want to share? Um, the second is regarding medical planning sites. Uh, maybe I read the plans wrong, but I didn't see the imaging departments on level one. Um, but ED is on level one. How do you handle the ED imaging needs? Thanks. Yeah, I can answer that ah. second question first. The, yeah, ED has its own um, CT and uh, to service it. So I'll say the hospital's MRI, if you will, and CT and RAD and all the rest is on, is on level two but the ED has dedicated imaging on level one inside the department. To, to answer your first question, it's not really a true, I mean, it's, we would have loved that whole element to be cantilevered, uh, but the, the columns are inset, I believe seven feet or so. Uh, the columns do come up into a column tree that we developed with KPFF to bring back the, to push the columns back to the exterior of the building once you hit the bed floors, because having the columns uh, positioned where they are through uh, the patient floors would have um, impacted head walls uh, for all of those locations where the columns are. So the, the structural solution was actually quite interesting and, and quite clever that KPFF came up with um, with us. Thanks. Um, I did get a question here um, privately uh, saying, what was the original budget for the project? If you don't want to answer this question, you know, um, uh, the cost per square foot, was there any unknown factors during the process that had an impact on the overall cost? So I, I can speak to the first section. We actually not that far off from our original budget. Um, the original budget was 544 million. Um, obviously because of existing conditions and a lot of the unknowns as well as the changing markets, um, you know, there, there has been some shifts as well as uh, changes to the overall design from facility and regulatory requirements. Um, so I, I don't believe that we're, we're that far off from our original budget. Um, but there's actually a lot that, that went into the initial planning and the, the initial, you know, putting together of that budget. Okay. Um, and then Stacy Hooper. Stacy, if you're still with us, do you want to share your question with the group? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm so happy to see all of these um, improvements at the, this facility because this is actually where my family <laughs> goes. Um, and my husband had surgery here and I was waiting out the lobbies like very deep as you're showing and I was waiting out in that island with cars surrounding me. <laughs> it was very, I mean, it's a substantial uh, improvement. So um, I also want to say that I was at the MOB earlier this year and um, the handling of traffic on the site, um, is really well done. I mean, it was, it really struck me how clear um, that experience experience was um, because I was not familiar with the construction that was happening. Um, I'm, I did want to um, ask a little, little bit more about the decision to locate the parking structure where it is because it's pretty far and the existing parking structure is already pretty long. Um, I'm sure that you guys did a lot of different studies about site flow and opportunities for reducing cross car 
pedestrian floors and maybe even adding more green space um, than the than the garden area. But I just wanted to hear a little bit more about about that decision. So we we did look at a, a number of locations for the the garage, and that ended up being the the best suited um, during the, the master planning effort uh, to hit the required counts that, that we needed for the campus. The, the bigger idea for the garage being located there is that patient, uh, patient parking will move into the garage that is closer to the hospital and staff parking will be um, taken into the, the new garage. So again, focusing the um, the experience on the, the patients and giving them the shortest distances to the garage, I mean, to the hospital and locating uh, staff and uh, physicians in the, the garage that's further away. I Great. hope that answered your question. I think the other component too is we really look for every opportunity to enhance that uh, that walk, if you will, from the parking structure. Mm -hmm. um, uh, right, the, the way it was before, you came out of the structure, we couldn't change where the street was, you know, that you would cross to go to the, between the parking structure and the main, main lobby. Uh, the, you know, we, we couldn't relocate that street. But, um, so you have a crossing, but the idea was to really change the, the nature of that experience. Uh, and also, when we move the, uh, when, when some of, a lot of the traffic right now, that's how you get into the parking structure, right? We go past the hospital, but uh, for the staff anyway, moving them away, they'll have their they'll have a separate entrance, so they won't there won't be as much traffic. At least that's the idea, uh, right at the front door there. So it won't be so bad. 